Hi, everybody who's here. We're going to wait a few minutes. We still have people entering the waiting room. And Mary Jane, what do you think? Should I wait till like 6.03, 6.02? That sounds good. I um, I just muted all of the attendees. Um, so, but I think everyone who is speaking should be able to still speak um, because they're uh, listed as presenters. We haven't had anyone new join for at least a minute now, so maybe we'll kick things off. Uh, oh, as I say that, there's a little beep. Will. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Katie McLean, and I am the chair of the Medway Community Forest Co-op. Uh, we're coming at you virtually again this year, even though we had great deliberation and hopes of doing an in-person meeting. Um, we think we can get the business done here and host some really great field days, which you'll hear about later on. Uh, we're going to keep things rolling along through our meeting. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day outside, at least in this part of the province. I'm in Annapolis Royal right now. Uh, so thanks for sitting inside at your screen uh, during this time, but maybe it's a nice break if you have a fan or air conditioning because it was pretty warm over here today. Um, I think everyone at this point is pretty familiar with online meetings, but uh, Mary Jane has muted the group if you have any questions. Uh, if you can use the raise hand button throughout the meeting and then uh, you could also add things by typing in the chat. We'll try and address any pressing questions as promptly as possible as we go through uh, or if it's something we think is addressed later, we may just pause and wait until we get to it uh, or wait until a more natural break in the meeting. And we are also uh, recording and, and are we uh, sharing this live, Mary Jane, perhaps I should know that. Just recording. Okay, so so everyone is aware you are being recorded, so you can opt whether to, to speak on the microphone or use your camera or not. But it is great to see a few faces on my screen. Uh, I think, do you want to open up the slides, MJ? Or do you want me to do that? few more people. Okay, so like I said, this is our annual general meeting, but you all knew that, so we can move on to our agenda. Uh, so we're going to do some welcome and introductions. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a guest speaker who is able to join us, Jennifer Gunter from the British Columbia Community Forest Association. Uh, we then have our staff team who's joined us to provide updates. And I think this is really exciting opportunity because we have a very different contingent of staff members than we did a year ago for those of us who haven't checked in since that point in time. Uh, and then we'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes and, and work through the business meeting and AGM portion. Uh, so if that sounds okay, maybe what we'll do is have any board members who are present on the call give a brief introduction. Does that make sense to do now? Looking for a nod, Mary Jane. Okay, uh, so again, I'm Katie McLean. I am the, the chair for the Community Forest. Um, I'm on a kind of second in a row parental leave, but when I do work, it's with an environmental conservation organization called Clean Annapolis River Project. 
uh, and I'm based out of Granville Ferry. So uh, that's a bit about me. And I guess it's also worth mentioning, I'm also involved with the uh, Working Woodlands Trust, kind of a sister organization to the, the MCFC uh, and treasurer for that organization. And perhaps for expediency, I will call people out in no particular order to introduce themselves. So Fritz, you're up next. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Friedrich Meyer or Fritz. I am uh, the board of directors with the MCFC and I am the treasurer. And if in case you wonder why it's dark in the back, I'm currently on vacation in Germany and it's just after 11 here. Uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. And Abby. Hi, everyone. I'm Abby Lewis. I work with the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. And on the MCFC board, I have the role of uh, secretary, <laughs> joining you from sunny Liverpool. And up next, I see Don. Hi, Don Kimball here, I'm a board member. Uh, I'm also associated with the Land Trust, small landowner in South Brookfield, and I'm a furniture maker by living. Thanks, Don. Uh, Heba. Uh, hi, I'm Heba. I'm a board member at large, and I work for the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables out of Fleet and Forest Protection. Uh, so I mostly do forest health work and research surrounding that. Thank you. I'm scrolling down. Uh, Mike. I'm uh, Mike Lancaster. Sorry for not having my uh, camera on. I just came out of the field and I'm afraid that I might scare any children. Uh, I'm also just finishing dinner. So um, I'm the, the vice chair, uh, graciously following Katie's amazing lead. And I've been on the board for, I think it'll be about four years this, this fall, which doesn't really feel like nearly that long. But um, yeah, it's a great, great group and, and very grateful to, to work with them. Uh, and I think Fritz in particular should be commended for coming in at 11 p.m. In, in Germany. So thank you very much, Fritz, and welcome everybody else. And Will? Good evening, everyone. Uh, Will Martin, a uh, board member. I've been with the Community Forest since the beginning. Um, and uh, my day job is uh, I, I'm, I work with the American Forest Foundation. And I'm scrolling through. I feel like I missed one or two board members on this list. Maybe if I missed you, jump in while I search. There's Peter Neely. Oh, there you are, Peter. Peter, you're up. Hi. Um, my camera come up? No, I guess not. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm my second year for board member at large with the uh, organization. Uh, recently retired from the Department of Natural Resources last year and uh, as a forester. And uh, yeah, I live in Truro. Thank you. And I think that's everyone who's on the call right now. Does that look right? I think so. So there's a few people who might join in later. We'll see. Um, but we are going to take a moment uh, for a land acknowledgement. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting today from Gesbwick and perhaps beyond, uh, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and Wolof Dikwe people first signed with the British Crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and title and established the rules for what was going to be an ongoing relationship between nations. 
And we want to note that the term crown land is a particularly complex topic when discussing reconciliation. Canada as a nation was built on lands that were already occupied by Indigenous peoples who were living on their own lands, under their own laws, and in their own societies at the time of discovery, uh, or so to speak, and colonization by Europeans. So we acknowledge the Mi'kmaq as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land and thank them for sharing their homeland with us. We are all treaty people. And I'm just going to go and check the comments because I did hear something happen, but I don't see anything in there. Uh, and I think with that, we're going to jump over to our guest speaker. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to Jennifer Gunter. Uh, and Jennifer, if you want to call your slides up, well, I take care of this. So with over 20 years of experience working in community forestry and community economic development, Jennifer is a passionate advocate for community-based resource management. Jennifer was born and raised in New Brunswick and moved to British Columbia in 1996 to pursue a master's in resource management from Simon Fraser University, focusing on community forestry. After completing her studies, Jennifer moved to Caslow, BC, where she lived for 15 years with her family on a small farm. Relocating to Victoria in 2014, Jennifer continues to devote her energy to building sustainable local economies and to forest management that benefits local people while creating more resilient ecosystems. One of the co-founders of the BCCFA and longtime executive director, she has had the pleasure of working with the board of directors, staff, and membership to help it grow from an organization of just 10 member communities to one of over 50. Uh, and this is an organization we all have a lot to learn from. So it's very exciting to have the opportunity to hear from you, Jennifer. With that, I'll Thank turn you. it over to you. Thank you so much, Katie. And can you hear me okay? Thumbs up. Awesome. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to join your AGM, um, everyone. It's a real honor and a privilege to um, to be here with you this evening. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, who are today known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, which is the area around Victoria on Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a great... Um, introduction as you can see I've got um, you know my roots in New Brunswick and I've lived out in BC for over half my life but um, I uh, have a really strong connection and bond to the Maritimes so I thought what I would do today is take about 20 minutes if that if that works for you all and then we can have um, a, a really good uh, well however much time you have for Q&A uh, to give you a bit of background on community forestry in BC, uh, where we're at today, I'll talk about our association and the formation of the network of community forests that we have here in BC, and talk about some of the advocacy work that we do to promote community forestry in the province, and then touch briefly on some of the challenges and opportunities that we see moving forward, and then hopefully that will spur on some good conversation that we can have. So I think, um, you know, the Medway Community Forest Cooperative is, um, you know, an excellent example of what community forestry can be in Canada. Um, we have a particular uh, version of it out here in British Columbia. At its core, it's about local control over the benefits offered by local forests. Um, in BC, this form of forest management, which we consider to be innovative, generates economic, social, cultural, and environmental benefits, both for local uh, communities and for the province. And I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit later in my presentation about how I think community forests are a model for how forests can be managed on a larger scale. Just uh, for those that might not be really familiar with the tenure that we have here in British Columbia, uh, I think BC is pretty unique in Canada for having a community forest tenure as part of its forestry legislation. Um, it was introduced in 1998, and it's really 
to be honest, one of the reasons why I, I moved out west was to um, to learn more about what was happening here in community forestry. And it just so happened to be really good timing because everything was just getting going uh, here in the province at that time. So the community forest agreement is uh, what the tenure type is called. And it's a long-term type of license. It's granted to communities. Uh, it's meant to be perpetual. Uh, potentially, anyway, they're 25 year licenses that can be renewed. Um, and we call them area based. So in BC, I, I'm not sure if the same is true in Nova Scotia, we have um, area based tenures, which are for a fixed um, geographic area of land, and then volume based tenures, which kind of operate on a larger timber supply area. So community forests are area based, which is, of course, very important. Um, the the license gives communities the exclusive right to harvest timber, and they have to adhere to all applicable, you know, provincial legislation, regulation and policy, including the Forest Act and the Forest and Range Practices Act. It started out as a pilot program around the year 2000, after the uh, tenure was introduced to legislation, and it really quickly gained momentum and popularity, I guess you could say, uh, you know, demonstrating success pretty early on. We had about 10 pilots in the beginning. And then in about 2003, it became, I'd say, more entrenched in the forest tenure system in the province. And the provincial government at the time decided to expand the program pretty dramatically. It was, you know, it was it, at a time in British Columbia that you know, we'd seen in the 1990s, the war in the woods, there was you probably some of you may remember the demonstrations that happened to oppose industrial logging in Clockwatt Sound. Um, you know, First Nations were really beginning to have a voice and uh, communities also were saying, hey, we want more control over what's happening in our backyards. And the the community forest pilot program was, I think, in part in response to that. Um, and by 2003, the, the provincial government of the day decided to um, to respond to a greater degree by offering more tenure opportunities to First Nations and to communities. And so we really saw an expansion of the community forest program in in the 2000s. And that that growth has continued incrementally since that time uh, to the point where we now have 61 community forests operating in the province. Um, the licenses are granted to community-based organizations, and they can be a whole range of different legal entities. So we do have some co-ops, uh, also nonprofit societies. Then we also have community-held corporations, and and in many cases, and this is coming to be kind of one of the preferred models, is a partnership, uh, a limited partnership between a, a First Nation and a non-Indigenous community, and we have quite a few of those. Um, the, the tenures range in size greatly. So the smallest is just under 400 hectares, and the largest is over 200,000 hectares. And of course, their allowable annual cut uh, ranges in in uh, in size accordingly. Um, the average, though, is around um, 37,000 uh, cubic meters. This map uh, shows. Uh, the distribution of community forests around the province. Uh, the, the names that you see on there are actually the names of the towns, not the names of the community forests. So if you go to our website, you can see this in greater detail. Um, as I mentioned, the, the tenure was brought into the Forest Act in the late 90s. Our Community Forest Association was formed in 2002. Uh, it was when the pilot program was happening and both the practitioners involved in those community forests as well as the government said, hey, we really need an industry association to represent these tenures. They have unique characteristics and they need to have a voice. And so we formed a nonprofit society. Uh, we started out with just 10 member communities. And we now have over 50. This is a picture of us at our conference in AGM in Logan Lake in 2023. This year, uh, in June, we went up to Mackenzie, which is in northern BC, which was very cool. We tried to move our, our conference in EGM around the province every year to a community that has a community forest. 
So the membership elects a 10 member board of directors and they hire the management. So I'm the executive director and I uh, work with a small support staff or a pretty lean organization. Um, as an association, we have a number of focus areas, but I would say overall, the, the main areas of focus would be uh, advocacy, advocacy or what we call external relations and then uh, member services. So extension, building the network, uh, trying to keep our members up to speed on what's happening um, and connecting them with one another. I like to say that there aren't any experts in community forestry in the province. We're all just learning and we have a lot to learn from each other. So we have a, a pretty strong network now that we've built across the province of community forest practitioners. And these will be people, you know, when we get together for our conferences and AGMs, the folks that come would be the managers of the community forests and staff, but also people that serve on the boards of directors of those organizations. Um, we also work on education, so trying to uh, promote the concept of community forestry within the members of the public and also to influence uh, decision makers. And we connect with academic institutions. We have a longstanding partnership with uh, UBC, uh, with uh, Simon Fraser University as well, trying to make sure that community forests are part of the curriculum of the forestry schools, and also that students have opportunities to research and learn about community forests and then hopefully work in community forestry as well. Um, on the advocacy side of things, I'll speak maybe a little more to this later in my presentation, but we've always tried to adopt a really collaborative approach with government, you know, bringing solutions to problems and, uh, yeah, trying to work in a positive manner and to cooperatively look to solve problems. And I think that that approach has, has served us quite well. Um, half of the uh, community forests, uh, half of those 61 are held by First Nations or a partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. And this, as you can imagine, is a huge um, aspect of what community forestry is all about in BC. We've, um, we work hard as an organization to provide uh, educational opportunities and resources to our members. We found that uh, about 73% of them say that they've, um, that they're, you know, actively taking steps to respond to the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, those that are not held by First Nations, those community forests that don't have First Nations as owners, um, will usually have an MOU with local First Nations or, you know, engage in cooperative planning um, and certainly create employment opportunities and educational opportunities as well. So it's it's an ongoing effort and of great importance to everyone working in community forestry in BC. And I can tell that it's the same for you in Nova Scotia. Um, another thing about the tenure itself that I like to emphasize is the fact that it in my view, creates really strong incentives for uh, ecological stewardship. The fact that it's community held, that it's long term, that it's area based, these are super important elements of the of the legal underpinnings of the tenure that create uh, strong incentives for thinking long term and managing for future generations. So we do see lots of community forests investing in ecosystem restoration and stewardship activities that go above and beyond what they'd legally be required to do. Um, this picture is grassland ecosystem restoration that is being done by the Esketum First Nation on their community forest. So another important factor, I guess, about the tenure here is that the province actually set out uh, in the beginning eight goals for our program. And these are things that really set the community forest program apart from other kinds of forest tenure in the province. And they include things like environmental stewardship, that community involvement and participation piece, certainly building stronger relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and people, and also promoting innovation. When you stack those goals up, they're the ones on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, when you compare those to what's generally understood uh, as the goals of the 
you know, the large primary timber processing industry, they're, they're pretty different. There's, there's a lot of significant differences. And of course, this is by design, right? The community forest program was set up to be, to offer communities the chance to do something different. They really wanted to have more control over the lands around their towns um, and to be able to manage for community values. So it was always intended to be different. Um, one of the challenges, of course, that we face is that we're still part of the forest management system. I think the same is probably true for, for your community forest. And so you're constantly kind of struggling against the forces that are creating legislation and policy for the major and the, the big players um, that don't always work for smaller tenures. We have the same, we have woodlots in BC as well. They're, they're on provincial, um, you know, what's known as crown land. And they face the similar kinds of challenges. So um, it's uh, we always have seen community forests as a bit of a square peg in the round hole of forest policy in the province. And that is a big reason why we need an association like ours is to be able to advocate for our unique um, needs. So one of the ways that we do that or we have come to do that is by creating an annual survey and report. And these are available on our website. We're now in our 10th year of doing this. We worked with people in the Ministry of Forests, um, with uh, academics, other forest professionals and experts to come up with 18 indicators of the social, economic, cultural and environmental benefits of community forests. And we ask our members to report on these every year. We tried, if you have a chance to look at the reports, you'll see that, um, you know, the indicators were chosen to be things that people could probably just look at their financial statements and their annual reports, maybe to their their bo boards and, and shareholders to draw out information so that it's not too too onerous to the community forest managers to report. But when we bundle it up, we were able to tell really compelling stories about what community forests are doing all across the province. Of course, we we look at, you know, the economic side of things of the, the jobs and the economic contributions that community forests are making. We find that uh, ever since we started asking these questions, that community forests create more jobs per cubic meter than the industry average in their forestry operations. Um, they're mostly uh, independent log sellers. So the, the jobs that are created uh, when logs go to mills we sort of tally that up separately. But when we look at just the forest management side of things, we see that, um, yeah, they create more jobs for cubic meter. And I think that's because of the types of forest management that they're doing. And some of the indicators I'll speak to next will probably give you some insight into that. In addition to those jobs, of course, they're using their profits to reinvest in their communities. They all have kind of their own um, policies around how they might disperse profits um, to, you know, as dividends to shareholders, which are the communities, or sometimes they have grant programs. There's a whole um, array of different approaches. But that's, so the economic part, of course, is important. Um, they also, as I mentioned, are independent log sellers. For the most part, they don't have their own mills. A few have small micro mills, but mostly they're selling into the market, trying to get the best value that they can and selling logs to the full spectrum of, of uh, milling and manufacturing facilities. They're also investing a lot in education and recreation. So these would be some of the key social benefits that we see uh, community forests uh, bring to their communities. They've, um, I think they've built and maintained close to, uh, I think this figure is last year. So I think in our, this year's survey, we found they're close to like 1400 kilometers of trail. And of course, they're putting in their own uh, volunteer time to organize activities and supporting local uh, schools and rec groups. We also see uh, investments in forest stewardship. So like that grassland ecosystem restoration, that cultural burning that you saw in the previous slide would be an example of that. This is another great example. Uh, Nacusp Community Forest is pictured here and they are in the Southeast part of the province where mountain caribou uh, is struggling to survive, they're endangered. And so the community forest has partnered with a uh, local conservation group, the Arrow Lakes Caribou Society to build a maternity pen for caribou. And uh, th these pictures are students um, 
I think they're UBC forestry students helping to collect lichen that are used every year to help feed the caribou over the winter. We also look at environmental or compliance with environmental standards, and we see that most community forests are exceeding, uh, you know, go, going above and beyond. And uh, in the last few years, the conservation of old growth forests has again become really top of mind for the public and uh, everyone working in forestry. And we find that about 75% have plans in place for conserving old growth in their community forests that go above and beyond what is um, legally required at this point in time. Of course, public engagement is um, a really important indicator. So we ask questions around that. We see that uh, you know, societal values, of course, are changing, priorities are changing, and it's so important for community forest boards and managers to be in tune with that, right? Um, this, again, is a, a photo of the, uh, in the Nikusp community forest of the manager with the local cross-country ski club trying to figure out some, some plans of where logging is going to take place that overlaps with cross-country ski trails. A huge... Um, issue for us and I think really for everyone now across Canada is wildfire. We've been managing the proactive, uh, sorry, we've been measuring the proactive uh, management of wildfire in community forests now for 10 years. Uh, that work actually goes back farther than that. Some of our community forests were really set up with the um, intention or a very high priority placed on reducing the risk of wildfire to communities. Uh, people see that forest management can take a really active and positive role in that effort. So most of our community forests are working with their local governments on wildfire management. Many of them have plans for their whole community forests that look to how they can reduce um, the risk to the communities and also to the forest ecosystems. Fire is a hugely important natural component of most forest ecosystems in British Columbia. And we've part of the problem that we're facing is the fact that we've excluded fire from the land for um, about 100 years. And the forests that people have come to know and love that are these like carpets of contiguous green across the hillsides is actually quite unnatural and unhealthy and is setting setting us up for the mega fires that we're seeing today. So a lot of the work that we're doing in community forestry is trying to restore more resilience to uh, our ecosystems. The involvement of First Nations in that work is so important. Um, we have within our community forests uh, that have First Nations partners, uh, traditional fire keepers who are teaching people, oh yeah, actually here's what we used to do. Here's how we used to use fire on the land to um, help support ecosystem resilience and uh, there's a lot of effort in the province now to bring fire, the intentional use of fire back, and then also to uh, reduce the loading of fuels that we have around our communities, which are the result of that fire suppression, also past forest management activities and other kind of land management measures. Um, so the province has recognized the role of community forests in this important work. Um, we the, we were uh, given some funding a few years ago to help support wildfire risk reduction uh, operational treatments within community forests. And now we're working on a partnership that focuses both on that um, mitigation side, but also talking to managers about how they can be perhaps engaged in preparing for wildfire and even wildfire response. So we're working on this partnership. We're currently doing a needs assessment of community forests in the province to see where they're at, because some of them have a lot of capacity in this regard, and others are just getting started. Um, the picture in the top there is a, a youth crew in Logan Lake. So Logan Lake is one of these community forests in the interior that um, recognized the the um, the threat of wildfire to their community, and it was one of the reasons why they got a community forest. They they said, yeah, we need one because we need to have control over how these forests are managed and we want to we want to treat them. We want to create um, treatment areas and um, um, like fuel breaks and that sort of thing in the forest to protect the community. And in fact, 
Um, they had a really big wildfire two years ago that where some of those treatments were tested and they were found to be um, quite effective. So they have a youth crew that works in the summer every year doing fuel treatments. And then um, when it's time to burn the piles, they get pulled back out of school to go burn the piles and roast marshmallows on them. And they they love that. So um, it's, a, it's a really becoming a really big part of what community forests are doing in BC. And it's it leads really well into a conversation about, you know, opportunities and challenges. So as I mentioned before, community forest struggle, because we're always swimming, swimming against the stream, it feels like in terms of forest policy in the province. But now, I would say, increasingly, people are looking to community forests for solutions, because we've got over 20 years under our belts now of innovation and being able to respond to community priorities, managing the forest uh, differently. I think, you know, you're trying to set that that example as well in the, in the Medway community forest. And so we now have uh, policymakers coming to us and saying, hey, how can we take the the concepts and ideas that are we're seeing in community forests and sort of scale that up and and have those approaches be applied more broadly across the land base. So these are just some images of different forest policy initiatives that are happening in the province. Um, so I'll leave it there. I hope that this is um, giving you a little bit of a glimpse into what we're up to these days. I would uh invite anybody to get in touch with me if you want to learn more and also to check out our website and i would mention that if you're interested in learning more about community forests when you go to our website you'll see a member section and you can follow links to the websites of all of those you know all of our member community forests and that's where you really get you know into the the um the good stuff around what everyone is up to right now. So thank you so much. And I'll uh, maybe I'll just stop sharing my screen and we can open it up for questions. Thank you. There's a lot of really interesting parallels between what is happening here and and interesting to see from an organization with more maturity than ours how things have played out. And I can see uh, I think Tom Rogers had added a question uh are invasive species management a part of your forest association yeah absolutely i think that that that's part of the um uh like the rules and and requirements here in bc is to try to mitigate invasive species and to manage for them and i think there's probably it's probably one of those things like you know, there's the there's the baseline of what everyone is required to do, and then there would be instances where people are going really above and beyond to um, to try to remove and, and mitigate the um, the spread of invasive species. Katie, do you want me to just call if I see like Will's got his hand up? So yes, sorry, yeah. Will, I didn't see your icon there. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was I should let other people ask questions, but Jennifer, <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation and it, it's great to finally hear you speak. Super interesting. Um, I would love to just hear a little bit more of your experience or maybe even advice for us um, in that sort of transition from obviously a lot of advocacy in the beginning to create the structures for community forestry. But then how do you maintain strong relationships with government as you're operating community forests through time? Um, so I'd love I'd love to just hear a little bit more of that. And I'd also really interested in this um, limited liability partnership structure with some of the First Nation communities and how that came about, what sort of how those relationships were built and how the how the dialogue sort of enabled that structure to be formed. Mm hmm. OK, you bet. So for, first question around um, the. You know, that is it will about really like how do you establish that working relationship with government? Maybe less established, yeah. but just once you get through the like a lot of negotiation to create the agreements yeah. and structures and but then there's like actually keeping it a healthy and strong relationship through time. Yeah. So, and and that's and and you're speaking about like 
the relationship between the pro provincial government and the community forests? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was the first question. I yeah, know I yeah, yeah. squeezed in two questions. <laughs> no, there, no, no, so, it's good. Yeah. I just want to make sure because like there's like, you know, I could go off on lots of different tangents, I'm sure. Um, I think that we were fortunate in that there were people in government in the province that said um, it would be of great value to us to have a connection with the community forest folks, you know, that that they and that and that was inside the Ministry of Forests. Um, we have a, a branch called Tenures Branch, and it was the director of Tenures Branch that said, we need, you know, we have we have connections with other industry associations. We should um, create one with the community forest folks. And I think they really recognized the unique nature of the tenure and that we were trying to do something different. And I think they got it that we would just be, you know, lost if um in the crowd if you will if if there wasn't a, a connection made so so we set up what we still call today the community forest joint working group and that's a a group like a committee that meets every month and it's myself and uh one of my susan mulkey another long-standing staff person with the bccfa and a couple of my board members and we meet every month with um, a group of people from Tenure's branch. And we talk about everything to do with the tenure itself. And then those, those people within that branch in the Ministry of Forests also help to connect us with other people working in government um, on different policy matters because the Ministry of Forests is so big. So if it's something to do with... Um, you know, uh, stumpage policy, it's going to be someone in pricing branch. So they help connect us with that person. If it's going to be some something about, you know, old growth management, uh, for example, then we're connected with people. So we kind of have this hub um, that was established, uh, honestly, like in 2003. And I, and I've been, I've been working, I've been doing this job since since 2002. So, um, and I keep all the notes from those meetings and I number them. And so we're now on meeting like 175 of that, of that committee. And, um, like having that consistency, I think like having that institutional memory is great. Like that's, that's kind of a, a been a bonus for us that we've had people that, you know, I guess like myself who've wanted to stick with this for so long. Um, but being able to really hold the the organizations accountable for maintaining those long-standing relationships like that it's not just an ad hoc thing we you know we have this joint working group and you know the forest minister knows that we have this joint working group and will say like you guys are working things out right how's it going <laughs> um so i think if if you can find ways to create that um those kinds of institutions that can be durable, then that will help a lot. And, and your other question was about those partnerships. So I'm not the governance expert in our organization. That's my colleague, Susan Mulkey. So she could really geek out on you and tell you why the limited partnership is the best model. <laughs> but um, I think just in general, like speaking to the notion of those partnerships, I guess you know, since the inception of the Community Forest Program in BC, um, you know, there, there's a recognition that the the these, you know, crown tenures are on unceded um, territory of, of First Nations. And so it seems I'd like if, if you're going to try to confer management rights to a non-Indigenous community, it certainly seems like a no-brainer that you would also um, be including the First Nations in that area. And I think over time, it used to be that a First Nation could get a community forest or a non-Indigenous community could get a community forest. Now, um, I would say it's pretty much always a partnership. Like the, the newer ones are all are, are partnerships. There are other forms of tenures that First Nations alone can access in the province. We have something called the First Nations Woodlands License, which is specifically um, meant for First Nations. So they have additional opportunities, but 
also opportunities to to partner. And the legal structure of that partnership, um, I think, is quite sound and uh, has some tax benefits as well, I believe, for for the community forest organization, too. That's great. Thank does, you so does, much. Does that, is that is that answer your question? Yes. Enough? Yes. Yeah. That was really but if you, helpful. Yeah. If you want to learn more, get in touch with me and yeah. we can um, certainly hook you up with resources. Uh, Matt had also posed some questions, so I'm going to read off from the chat. Um, what are the conditions for establishing a new community forest in BC? And then there's follow ups. Are they largely political or policy driven? And I don't want to cut it off, actually. Yeah. Or is there an open door for communities to step forward and organize a particular yeah. forest area? So this is a really good question um, and all the follow-up questions as well, because it's actually really hard to get a community <laughs> forest. Um, that the that that big growth that happened that I mentioned in the like from 2003 for a few years happened because the provincial government did a huge take back of volume in the province. They took back 20% um, of the tenured volume from, from everyone, like from all licensees in the province. And I should say, like, I think it's 95 or, or maybe even 97% of the province is, is provincial crown land. So they had, you know, the ability to have a huge influence and, and they did that 20% take back was um, companies were compensated for that. And then the province used that to set up um, what's called BC timber sales, which is a government program that helps to set our um, stumpage rates in the province. Uh, we have uh, the market pricing system and it's derived from that, that program. So a chunk of it was to set up that program, which was in response to the softwood lumber dispute. And then um, and then the government at the same time said, and we want to increase the amount of volume that First Nations hold, and we want to increase the size of the community forest program. So all of a sudden there was a lot of um, timber harvesting rights that were available to, to allocate to the community forest program. So a lot of, I think by the end of that process, we had about 35 or 40 community forests. And since then, it's been more incremental growth. And so the challenge is that in order to create a community forest, the way that our um, legislation works is that you, it, it, has to, it has to have an AEC, it has to have uh, volume that can be uh, apportioned to it. That's the word that they use is apportionment. And um, all of that volume is already spoken for, right? So there's already um, all the licenses that can be distributed around the province have been distributed. So it's challenging to like either take back volume or buy back volume or find other mechanisms. Maybe they realize, oh, our inventory wasn't very good and we have new inventory and we actually see that we could increase the harvest in this area. So then we can carve off a bit of the um, allowable annual cut to create a community forest. Uh, we do have some instances now where communities have purchased licenses, like other licenses from other companies um, that are turning those into community forests. But it's it's a struggle. And so that, um, sorry, this is like way too long winded of an answer, but it's kind of the big, it's the big like thing that we're facing, right? Because with the success of the program, of course, you know, we would love to see every community in First Nation that wants a community forest be able to have one eventually. And so we're looking for potentially some big political decision decisions like happened in 2003 to say, yeah, OK, we do want to expand this program. Maybe it's um, maybe it is a longer term vision and a, and a government could bring in a, a strategy that would see progressive incremental growth of the program, I think that would be quite doable. We, there is um, recent legislation that was passed in BC that describes how to um, how the province can take back tenure and compensate existing licensees and then allocate that to, to community forests. So the foundation is there. Um, but, but, so, that, so that's the first part is like getting AAC and then figuring out the land base that it, that, that fits on. Um, so if a community uh, 
today doesn't have a community forest and they would like to get one that's try to i try to give them a a less complex answer but that's you know basically the idea is that we've got to we've got to figure out how to apportion volume to you so you can have these harvesting rights um and uh and then there is actually an application process so i think it's um uh, I believe it's still available online, but basically the community has to come together and describe what their vision is for the community forest. They have to create a management plan that speaks to how they'll address those eight goals of the community forest program. They have to have a business plan um, and they have to be able to demonstrate that they've got broad community support. And of course, that would include First Nations. So so even even in an instance where the province can say, oh, yes, we agree with you. There is this um, this volume that's available for a community forest. Then the next step would be for the minister to invite them to apply. And then they, they go through this like pretty rigorous process of of putting together an application to show that they have those all those pieces in place. And it takes about two years, I would say, like from from the point of of the province being able to green light a, a community forest to actually uh, landing it on the ground. Does that answer your question, Matt? Okay, great. <laughs> and Jane had one more question. I think we have time to field at least this last one. So um, to what extent has community forestry in BC helped raise public awareness about forestry in general? And is the impact mostly localized to the community forest areas or is there a wider influence on, on the public? That's a good question. Um, I, I think it's still a challenge. You know, I'd, I'd love to say that, you know, yes, it's everybody, you know, in BC is learning good things about forestry and forest management and that community forests are a big part of that, but I feel like there's still a real disconnect. And 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 British Columbia is one of the places, uh, you know, in Canada and the world that's becoming increasingly urbanized. And there seems to be at least there's a perception that there's a real kind of urban rural divide, and that people in the big cities like Vancouver, Lower Mainland, Victoria. Um, don't know very much about forest management and i'm not sure i think that's probably an oversimplification um you know because i'm kind of one of those people <laughs> now that lives in victoria and um, i think there's a lot of us that care about forests and forest management but um i do think that that education piece is a struggle and there's it's becoming um you know things have are, are again becoming really polarized here where uh, you know, there's there are a lot of um, campaigns by NGOs to try to um, raise awareness about uh, old growth conservation, for example, biodiversity, uh, climate, you know, carbon benefits of forests. And a lot of that is really important messages, but it also, in my view, tends to paint to um, simple a picture and that people aren't learning about the important role of active forest management in all of those values right um i think that forest active forest management is essential in in our province and i think probably across canada in restoring ecosystem resilience in helping us mitigate and adapt to climate change uh helping us uh protect our our communities from wildfire these and you know from um catastrophic uh weather events uh th like we've had terrible like we had record forest fire years followed by record um flooding here in British Columbia a few years ago and and good forest stewardship and forest management is so important to that so we're trying in our work in community forestry to convey those messages and i think at the community level it's probably better like it where the community forests exist, but it's it's varied, right? And and you still have, I, I'm sure that there are people in these communities that still don't know that they have a community forest or what it is. Um, and so it's it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing effort to raise awareness and to be able to demonstrate the the good, you know, the good things and and talk about the challenges as well. But 
um, yeah, it's, um, it's something that we're all pretty aware of and we're trying to get better at, you know, using social media and other tools to reach people. I think the fact that, um, you know, we see a lot of young people interested in community forestry, I think because of what it is. And so that's really cool that there are now, um, you know, younger generations coming in and perhaps entering into forestry that wouldn't have seen it as a, you know, an, an interesting or viable career in the past. So, and and a lot of those folks are quite interested in wildfire and climate adaptation as well. So I think um, trying to, to tap into that interest and, uh, you know, passion is, is helping. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. And Mike, maybe you'll close us out in terms of questions for the evening. Yeah, I wasn't sure if we had enough time, so thank you for that. I really enjoyed your presentation, Jennifer. Thank you very much for giving it. I'm, I'm sure you, you are aware that uh, with your connection to the Maritimes, in a lot of ways, we're very envious of what you guys have out there in terms of kind of the, the framework from a government structure as well as the land base. There's a lot of challenges that um, you've been able to overcome and, and have a head start on it. And it's it's great to hear that perspective. So one of the ones that I was kind of interested in hearing your thoughts a little bit further on was that quantification of the economic benefits, the general benefits that community forests bring um, and, and kind of how to best capture that and, and what areas you've kind of seen that be most compelling in your, your arguments with government. Because one of the, the kind of hurdles that we come up against is when we come to government and say we we need a larger land base in order to achieve our goals it's it's hard for us to make that case and it's we're often not given what we need to to kind of realize the vision that we're going for so um yeah just really interested in hearing your thoughts on kind of how best to capture all the values that that are brought with community forests yeah really good question mike thanks for that and i i would say you know that that issue of economy of scale was one that was really evident uh, when the pilot program began here in British Columbia. A lot of the pilots were quite well, were on the smaller end of the spectrum. And those managers who were, you know, mostly pretty experienced forest professionals, you know, spent their careers in forestry, were able to say to government, hey, you're you're asking us to you know, operate on a smaller land base than, you know, is the industry average, certainly um, a more contentious land base, because it's probably around a community with all of these multiple values that we're trying to to manage for. Um, you know, some people said it's the guts and feathers because, you know, every all the good stuff's already gone. And so we don't have a very, you know, economically profitable forest to operate within. Um, so you need to give us you need to give us um, some tools that we can work with. And one of the main things you guys might be aware of is um, we the community forests. We were successful in uh, advocating for an alternative stumpage regime for community forests, and that that was agreed to in two thousand and five, and has really um, led to I think a lot of the success that we see in community forestry in the province. And we continue to have to um educate um you know uh governments about the importance of that policy uh to the to the community forest program so um like the the community forest indicators sometimes we're able to say to uh decision makers hey this is the return on your investment this is this is you know collectively what you're what you're getting um, for favor in return for favorable policies that support community forests, um, and and honestly, Mike, I think it probably depends on which government you're talking to at the time. You know of of what's going to resonate resonate for them in terms of what's most important. Um, you know, jobs. We found that jobs per cubic meter is is really important to the current government. Uh, so we talk about that a lot. We talk about that as being kind of a, a value added aspect of community forestry, if you will, if we if we talk about value added in a really broad sense of the word. Um, for other 
for other governments, it might have been um, more what are the, uh, you know, what are the in investments in the the land base that community forests are able, able to make, and we can quantify those, uh, you know, that incremental silviculture, the wildfire risk reduction, the, um, you know, wildlife habitat restoration work, that kind of stuff. Um, and then other times it's more, what are the donations that they're making? Because because a lot of community forests will have profits that they can share within their community. So they love hearing about, oh, they helped buy an ambulance for their community or it went into a seniors housing project or, uh, you know, into recreation trail development, that kind of thing. So it kind of depends <laughs> on the way the wind is blowing, I guess, if, if uh, to put it bluntly on you know, what, what angle, um, is going to be most important in terms of that, like economic piece. Does that answer your question? Uh, l largely there, there are st mm -hmm. still some, some gaps in my understanding as to kind of what the best vehicles to drive that interest is through. Like I I'm kind of biased because my, uh, soon to be wife, um, has her master's in ecosystem services and the quantification of that from an economic scale. So I'm, I'm often kind of drawn to thinking about those types of like, how do we, we capture somewhat intangible contributions that ecosystems provide and assign a, a dollar value to that? Like if this, yeah. this area was kind of treated as the average public land Nova Scotia land base, what type of services would they generate versus what we're able to generate with our careful management? And how do you kind of wrap that into a package that says, hey, government, this is this is the dollar value that we've generated. I, it's a really complex thing to kind of go through and quantify. But I, I know that you folks have kind of more experience than we do in, in that type of quantification. Well, and maybe we haven't we, we probably haven't like as an association done exactly that kind of work. And the, I think that would be fascinating to to see that kind of a model. Um, yeah, we have, we don't, you know, what, what you'll see from our indicator survey is just way more kind of, it's it's more rudimentary than what you're describing. And I think that um, that would be really fascinating work for somebody to undertake and for us to be able to demonstrate. And I do think that it's one of those things about, you know, societal values changing and people really viewing for us more holistically. And I think think we see people in government seeing it that way as well and you know even just asking like oh well what if we what if we just put like a carbon lens on this then you know how would we how would we view this um for us differently and you know i think we're trying to um like i i like that idea of really like the multiple value um analysis and uh would be interested to learn more about that that research and that work for sure. Sounds like a good uh, thesis project for a Simon Fraser student in the future. Then, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and it maybe it maybe it has been has been done to some extent, but I um, I think that's the uh, yeah that's that's the, the direction we need to go in for sure. Great. Thank you both. I think. We're going to wrap up our guest presentation portion of the evening. So thanks so much, Jennifer, for being here and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, so much um, for making time to hear about what we're doing out here. And, and, and good luck um, with your meeting and with the year ahead. Thank you. I'm sure you'll hear from us again. OK, awesome. <laughs> thanks so much. Take care, everyone. And. MJ or others, if you're cursing me for going over schedule, don't worry, I promise to make it back in the business portion, uh, but we will promptly move over into staff updates. Um, and even though I don't think it was formally on our agenda, uh, I would really love for our staff who are on the call to be able to take a moment to introduce themselves because we've grown tremendously in size and there's a lot of energy and excitement. So, um, I don't know how to do this in the most organized way, except Matt, I see your face first, so maybe you can give a brief intro. Sure, thanks, Katie. Um, Matt Miller, uh, operations manager at MCFC. I've been with the organization since November of 2021, and uh, I'll hand it off to Jessica. Hey, everyone. Um, nice to meet and see a lot of new faces. 
Um, I'm Jessica. I'm the project coordinator doing the HWA program. Um, yeah, happy to see everyone. And I see Ellen on here. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ellen. I just started in April. Um, I'm working kind of between the Working Woodlands Trust and also the MCFC helping out with outreach and communications. And I know there's a few more staff hiding in the participant list, so you can jump up. Jesse, I see your name. Hey everyone. Um, I started with MCFC two months ago, which I can't believe it feels like I just started. Um, but I'm here for the summer and I um, I'm primarily working on trying to get the campground up and running. Um, as well as I led the annual bird surveys and um, also just helping Matt with anything that he's got going on on the operation side of things. Thanks. Thank you. And who else do I see in there? Bryce? Hi, everyone. I've met some of you before, but... Uh, my name is Bryce McBride. I'm the strike team lead for MCFC now. So uh, just started in late April and we're working on treating some hemlocks. And Matt or MJ, help me out. Any other staff who are on the call right now? I think Kyle is the last one. If you're there, Kyle. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Kyle, I'm the forest intern at Medway, um, and I'm a master's student at UMB working on tree marking. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Hey, hey guys, I'm 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 here too. Oh, oh Cameron, sorry, hi. Cam. <laughs> hey, sorry. You're technically so land trust staff, but we'll let you introduce yourself. Oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm a carbon and land trust intern for the land trust good to be here thanks guys thanks Cam. <laughs> okay um so we do have a series of staff updates to share um and i think maybe before that it i'm kind of going off script mary jane but i think it, it's nice to take a moment to kind of reflect over the past year because we are in a very different place like i, I keep repeating um but if you'll recall from our last AGM, we were kind of in a transitional period at the time. We had chosen kind of a different structure after we'd lost our executive director. And we had two staff members who took uh, the challenge to rise into more senior managerial roles. Uh, since then, Mary Jane Roger has actually rejoined the staff team as our executive director. And that would have commenced in the fall of uh, 2023. Um, and so she's going to be kind of taking the lead on a lot of our updates tonight. And I think there's actually a, an introductory slide, MJ, that you'd prepared to give people a little background on what the community forest is. Uh, so I know most people on the call know us fairly well. There's not a lot of strangers here, uh, but maybe worth a reminder, we're a member based for profit cooperative. Uh, very appreciative of your membership, so thanks to everyone who, who is a current member. Uh, we steward a, approximately 15,000 hectares of crowned land, and we are an area-based license. So again, some of the parallels uh, with what Jennifer was speaking about in BC. Uh, we have an elected board with a number of seats, and I'll talk more about the details of what those seats are later. Uh, and we are really piloting a multi-value approach to land management in Nova Scotia and working to figure out how to best serve our community uh, in any number of different ways. And up here, you'll see a map of our land base. So we are the purple polygon uh, running up against the Tobiatic and Kedjim Kujik. So um, I think that's the kind of Cole's notes of who we are. And with that, we'll jump into staff updates, Mary Jane. Great, thanks, Katie. Um, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll give a little a little introduction because um, I didn't with the rest of the staff updates. So, 
Um, my name is Mary Jane Roger. I'm the executive director here at the Medway Community Forest Co-op. As Katie mentioned, I rejoined the organization in September of last year after working for about a year and a half with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, prior to that, I've been with the Community Forest since um, February 2015. So if I hadn't have left, I would be nearing my 10-year anniversary, but I got some time to make up now. Um, so I, I am thrilled to be back and uh, it's really a, a kind of a new organization um, with lots of changes underway and lots of really exciting projects um, that we're looking forward to share with you today. Um, so I have kind of more general updates to go through with everyone and then followed by Matt Miller who will be giving our operations update and then Jessica Island will be giving an update on our HWA program. Um, and I'll ask maybe just similar to Jennifer's um, talk, if you could just pose any questions in the chat and then we'll have time to answer them um, at the end. I'm going to jump right in and uh, start with an update regarding our negotiations. Um, so many of you know this has been a, a long-standing item for us. Um, so we were initiated as a pilot project in 2015 on a three-year pilot project license agreement. So that was really to test to see if the initiative was viable and whether or not uh, we wanted to continue trying out this model of community forestry in Nova Scotia. And so I, I joked for a long time, like, oh, we're in year 10 of a three-year pilot, but I think that's <laughs> I think that's where we are now. Um, but we do have some really promising news and have progressed significantly in negotiations over the past year with the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. Um, so primarily, we actually have a new draft agreement for this longer term um, area based license. So this is something a, a step we haven't really been able to make in the past in specifically um, talking through some changes in the language surrounding our, our license agreement. So the key points that we've really negotiated that are going to differentiate us from traditional Crown land licensees are, is our ability to harvest non-timber products, our ability to develop commercial recreation opportunities such as our campground, and this revised financial structure that will really help us, as Jennifer was talking, give the kind of longevity and financial viability to make the, the project really succeed. So we do, there, there were obviously some um, sacrifices that were made during, as, as happens in negotiations with the government, and primarily one being that we were originally hopeful that we would have had an expanded license area through this process and um, that that was kind of seen as as an uh, something that was off the table kind of from the very beginning um 15,000 hectares may sound like a lot but when you start adding in all sorts of constraints and in particular the landscape of the forest that we manage a lot of it is quite young uh, most of it is quite young actually and then we do have quite a few kind of operational constraints on that license area too so we deal with a lot of rocky ground a lot of poor growing, growing conditions that really don't um don't necessarily grow the highest quality saw logs um so especially when you're practicing ecological forestry sometimes you know you need that larger footprint in order to make um a, a project viable so Although that was not on the table, we are hopeful that this revised economic model will help us, you know, achieve that long term self sufficiency that we're aiming for. Um, you know, the details towards that are still are kind of like that's the last piece that that we're we're working through with DNRR and particular on their end, they have to kind of clear these things with their trade lawyers and such so this is kind of like one piece that takes a little bit more time but we are anticipating an update actually um next week um so it's it's very promising um also we do have a longer term agreement it's not as long as we would hope for but we do have a uh, we're talking about a 10-year term that's on a five-year renewal cycle so a lot better than um, you know, what we're currently operating with, which is kind of like this annual renewal cycle that really doesn't allow for a whole lot of um, 
structure or ability to, uh, you know, pursue uh, loans or any sort of financing or that type of thing. So in this interim period, we are receiving grant contributions from DNR to kind of help keep the lights on and pay for um, some of just the bare minimum um, staff and operational costs. And then as you'll see later in our business meeting, we have been able to diversify quite a bit in some of our different funding streams and especially um, the integration of our Hemlock Willi Adelgid program. So I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump and give these very broad updates and that's that's all we kind of have for tonight. But um, of course, if anyone is interested in hearing more about any of these things, they can reach out to me directly. Um, next is our recreation update. Uh, we are planning to have a soft launch of the MCFC campground this August. Um, it's been a long, a long time coming and, and we're really making some excellent momentum with having Jessie on the team and she's really taken a really great leadership role in helping move this forward. Um, we did proceed with some major accomplishments in 2023. In particular, we completed the construction of our trail network as well as kind of the, the more um, the wider accessible trail within the campground itself. Um, we also had a uh, local South Shore business, Tilia Builders, uh, donate to outhouses, and those were installed by um, the contractor we've primarily been working with is Oneric uh, Excavation. They're also based in the South Shore. And then our summer student last year, Elizabeth, designed and installed and uh, some interpretive signage. Uh, one example I have here on my slide, um, some really beautiful signs that are actually currently installed in the campground if, if you happen to be in the area. Um, so we are in this like final stages, final push to get this project done in anticipation of the soft launch. So when I say soft launch, we're only opening about four campsites where initially the the kind of wider plan for the campground is about 10 to 12 campsites. Um, so just just kind of working things out slowly um, and, and testing as we go. Um, so I will just add that we do coincidentally have a volunteer day coming up this weekend on July 6th and are still actively recruiting um, hands to help with that and particularly folks who have some construction or landscaping or aren't afraid to do some heavy lifting in particular um, for that event. So uh, please reach out to uh, Jesse um, if that's something you're interested in. On the research side, um, we've been carrying through with a lot of the research that you would have heard about on at last year's AGM, in particular, our SAR bird mon SAR species, sorry, sorry about the acronym, species at risk bird monitoring. Um, so in particular, we're, we're extremely grateful for the partnership that we have with Dalhousie University and the Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute, and especially Sin Dr. Cindy Stacer and Abby Lewis from MTRI, um, who have been working very hard to um, put acoustic monitoring devices. So these are basically sound recorders that go in every single harvest block before we operate within them. So this is really like a novel approach. I'm pretty sure in forestry operations across Canada of doing this level of monitoring. And then we're using that information to inform um, our, harvest, our harvest operations. So not just seasonal timing, but also a little bit of information regarding some unique special management practices um, for certain species at risk um, and, and what they prefer in terms of habitat, habitat site um, for, for our post-harvest retention. A really exciting detection last year was, uh, and I might be wrong, <laughs> Here and Abby, you can correct me. Um, I believe uh, what we what Cindy and Abby found was the first uh, natural natural chimney swift nest in in fifty years. Is that was that right, Abby? As far as I know, okay. yeah. Yes. So most most folks know of chimney swifts and the fact that they nest in chimneys. Um, but through our acoustic monitoring, we found in one of our harvest blocks a natural chimney swift nest um, that was actually in a cavity of a tree, not in a in a, a chimney tree. Um, so just really helping 
uh, contribute to some wider research on some of these species that as well. And we did have a positive detection that uh, the tree that these birds were nesting in actually did snap in half uh, at some point over the winter, probably during one of our many windstorms, um, but they actually have been recorded using the site again this year. So that's really positive. And for those wondering, yes, that area was excluded from the future harvest plans. Uh, we have a couple other research initiatives on the go. I think with the loss of Jen Jenica Hunsinger, our past kind of staffer who was responsible for research, we, we haven't been as active in research in 2023. Um, but we are part of the Ecological Forestry Research Initiative that received funding from um, Research Nova Scotia to investigate uh, the actual implementation of ecological forestry. And that is part of our um, master's project that we have with Kyle McCarthy, um, in particular with the University of New Brunswick and Dr. Anthony Taylor. Um, and specifically examining um, the benefits of tree marking, both on an operational or productivity scale, as well as on a biodiversity perspective. So really looking forward to getting that research published and having that data in hand because tree marking has been something we've been advocating for in the province for many, many years. Uh, we also established a research trial with the Department of Natural Resources um, in an expanding group, expanding gap group selection harvest, um, which was a treatment that was originally established by Bowater back in 2010, I believe. Um, so we have research plots and we'll be conducting um, the treatment for that uh, this coming year. Uh, last but not least, uh, last year uh, we did several outreach events, um, in particular held our annual forest market and fair, as well as hold, held um, several um, tours, events with groups. Um, so one notable tour was with uh, the Nova Scotia Forest Professionals Association that was held during National Forest Week in September, my first day back, actually. Um, and then we held numerous other events with the Nova Scotia Community College, Dalhousie University, um, as well as smaller tours with some other community members. Um, we held a nature notebooking um, class with a local artist, Kaylin Robley. Um, and yeah, it was just another great year of uh, community events. Um, this year, we have several events planned already, um, particularly two forest photo walks um, that are kind of a pay by donation um, event where folks of all experience levels can go out and learn how to take nature photos. Um, we will be participating in some other kind of public outreach events like the Annapolis River Fest. Um, and then of course we will be holding our eighth annual forest market, which we should have the poster for very soon um, on August 25th. Um, and we have a September event with the Mersey Tobiotic In Research Institute um, that will be a basket weaving seminar as well as have a fall operations tour. And we have HWA training events kind of ongoing throughout the summer and fall. So with that, I will pass it off to Matt. Thanks very much, Mary Jane. Um, yeah, I really appreciate having MJ back uh, on staff as well as all the other faces that we have working now. So um, yeah, uh, admittedly, 2023 was a light year for forest operations, some of which was, uh, yeah, relative to staff capacity and and but uh, as well as the onboarding of of a major initiative with the the um, our HWA program, uh, but some of it was just was also uh, some other challenges. For example, our uh, we had awarded a silviculture tender that uh, that the winning contractor just didn't didn't follow through on, made it a challenge to get the PCT work done. Um, yeah, similarly some. Uh, some challenges with planning that I think we're in a really good position to move move forward uh, uh, coming forward. But we were able to get um, 
And just looking at 2023, we have had some harvesting this year, but just looking at the the year in 2023, we we completed one harvest. Uh, it was a large area for us, around 46 hectares, just over 1,400 tons of of harvest uh, of of wood harvested. That related um, ended up in about thirty thousand dollars worth of stumpage payments back to the crown, uh, as well as a small pre-commercial thinning operation uh, up on the west branch. I'll show you a map on that uh, in the next slide. Um, this year, sort of outside of our um, sort of standard operations, we've done a couple of novel. Uh, projects. Uh, MJ spoke to some of that diversification. So um, one of which was uh, hired by Kejimakujik National Park to oversee implementation of the civil cultural operating plan for Jeremy's Bay. So in 2020, um, MCFC was hired uh, and Mary Jane cre created an operating plan that would help manage uh, the impacts of hemlock woolly adalgid on the Kejimakujik campground. So parts of that campground are 90% hemlock and there was the plan spoke to uh, taking steps using uh, harvesting and silviculture to diversify the forest that's growing there. A uh, very similar approach to what the park did uh, about 15 years ago when there was a pale wing gray uh, moth outbreak that was impacting hemlock and saw some excellent results from the work that they did back then. And so, um, yeah, that was a very novel operation for sure. Um, worked with Atlantic Tree Solutions to complete that work. So Mitch Jameson is an arborist and relatively new entrant to the forestry world based out of Truro. Uh, Mitch and his team were, were really great to work with. Um, we also worked with Atlantic Tree Solutions to complete a mechanical pre-commercial thinning trial. So most of the silviculture work, all of the silviculture work that happens in Nova Scotia for pre-commercial thinning would happen with uh, brush saw operators using brush saws to, to operate. The challenge we have in Nova Scotia is a lot of the forest area that was harvested during the peak harvest years in the late 90s and early 2000s has become too tall for, for those traditional approaches. And so uh, working with funding from Department of Natural Resource and Renewables, uh, we brought Mitch and his uh, small excavator in to do some work uh, on the license area in Victory. Uh, and as well, really starting to focus on some of our heart, the hardwood resource that we have here. So did some uh, operational first, the first on, of its kind on crown land in the West, um, crop tree release silviculture. Uh, MJ, if you could go to the next slide, please. Whoever's running the slideshow. Uh, yeah, so again, this is, uh, this is a map showing the work that we were able to complete in 2023. Um, yeah, admittedly a little bit light, certainly more that we would like to see. Um, I will say that uh, we are now in the process of developing harvest plans for just under a thousand hectares of the license area. So um, over a couple of years of submitting annual operating plans and and my own uh, learning curve and in, in navigating the integrated resource management planning process for Crown Land, I think um, throughout for the next little while, we're in a really good position to, to really up um, uh, increase the amount of harvesting activity that we see here. And uh, I really would encourage folks to keep an eye on MCFC's website and social media, as well as the provincial um, harvest map plan viewer, um, because you'll be seeing some more harvests uh, being posted and, and planned in the next uh, couple of months. Go to the next slide, MJ. Uh, yeah, so this was the this was the work that we did this earlier this spring. Um, you can play the video there too. So you can see that's a small, um, about a five ton excavator, six ton excavator. Uh, it's got a, tr a hydraulic tree shear head, um, and so and very small machine and is able to kind of work its way through. So you can see that the orange flags are the crop trees that we've marked, and then. The machine is snaking its way through the woods and and releasing these trees as it goes. Um, this has been happening on private land in the central part of the province, and so there was a desire at uh, DNR to to make this happen on crown land, and and we're in a good position to do that. So, yeah, a bit of a novel treatment. You can go to the next slide, MJ. So, um, this was the work that we did. So, same you can see in the bottom right, um, really small scale uh, Atlantic Tree Solutions has a really unique offering of small scale harvesting equipment. So, it's the same six ton excavator that we used. It's a different harvesting head, um, very small scale, uh, light touch equipment. Um, and really, this was uh, there, there's not anything new about what we're doing. It's just the outcomes or the goals were a little bit different. So, 
Um, Mary Jane uh, had tree marked a single tree selection in this, in this part of the park with the goal of harvesting hemlock to promote diversification uh, towards other species to help um, help increase the resilience of the forest uh, in this part of Kedji. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Maybe one more slide for me on. Um, yeah, so this is a slide, uh, the map showing the current uh, group of approved harvests that we have. In the bottom left hand corner of the page, uh, you'll will be active back in the Northfield area uh, later on, uh, starting in late September, I suspect. But um, yeah, just to say that I expect over the next six months, you're going to we're going to see much more area on this map. Uh, the result of, of having some extra capacity at staff uh, as well as some summer students and uh, lots of ground. So yeah, really would encourage folks to, to stay tuned and we, we really wanna hear from folks when it comes to um, the work that we're proposing here. So yeah, stay tuned to our website and to the Harvest Map Plan Viewer as well. Great, Jess, um, we'll I'll go over to you now. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, nice to meet everyone. I'm Jessica. I'm the HWA project coordinator. I'm still pretty, almost a year in, but I feel new still to this whole project. I think the whole project is new in its whole. Um, but we can backtrack a bit and think about the evolution of this project so far. We uh, started in 2021 as a little volunteer effort to treat hemlocks against HWA at Sporting Lake. Um, and I think everyone realized that it was a significant effort that we had to start putting into the hemlock conservation. And we started from a volunteer movement into a collaborative effort with MCFC, various government agencies and uh, conservation organizations. So today we operate as a subcontractor. We're responsible for chemical treatment of Nova Scotia protected areas and exceptional private uh, woodlots. So our focal points for this whole program so far have been our strike team operations. Um, they're, they're the heart of our operation. There's uh, many people devoted to, to the strike team and they're professionals on the front lines they're ensuring that the treatments are applied efficiently and effectively every day. Our second focal point is our volunteer engagement. We've had so many great volunteers come out with us uh, throughout the season and last season. Their contributions extend our capacity to be able to treat areas and engage with our community. And we're, we're actively in, involving volunteers in various aspects of our project. Our training and education is our third focal point. Um, I'd say it's the co cornerstone of our efforts um, by training our team members, our community members, various organizations in Nova Scotia. We're ensuring that everyone's equipped with the knowledge and skills they need to perform all these tasks safely and effectively. And uh, it's helping us maintain a, a high operational standard. Go ahead, Mary Jane. Uh, yeah, so our progress last year and this year, uh, end of 2023, significant transition period for us. We welcomed an entirely new staff to the start of the fall season. So kind of end of our treatment season. Um, despite the challenges that come with such a transition, our team rose to the occasion. We successfully treated 237 hectares of hemlock forest, um, with most of the treatment actually taking place in the fall. It's definitely cooler. It's a uh, more relaxed time to be able to treat hemlock trees in comparison to this hot summer we've been having so far. Uh, the winter months were dedicated mostly to site assessments. So we go out and ground truth the areas, mark them in preparation for treatment, and we developed a lot of systems to improve our operational efficiencies and safety protocols. Spring so far, we welcomed in Bryce McBride as our team leader. He's been amazing at uh, operating the team out there in the field. And myself, 
team leader, two strike team members, and two NSCC students. Um, so since April, I think we started April 17th treating, we've treated 150 hectares. So in comparison to last year, we treated 237. We're more than halfway um, from what we did last year. All right, next one. So in 2023, we hosted numerous in-class training sessions uh, and field exercises. One highlight was a public demonstration day at Wenzel Lake, which provided hands-on learning experience and many, many participants joined. So that was a great opportunity for the public to join in. And uh, we also have nearly 150 hemlock heroes trained to date. So that really demonstrates the growing interest and commitment within our community. I'm so thankful for everyone who's participated in training days, volunteer days. It honestly makes such a huge difference uh, in all the field work that we do. Um, so far, actually this year, we've offered two hemlock hero training days and 24 volunteer days and more to come. So look at the calendar. I definitely want more people out there. It makes it so much more engaging for us out there in the field, changing it up and having people join us out there. Uh, another thing is we've trained 53 individuals representing seven organizations and three private businesses. So all aspects of HWA, we're your people. <laughs> Come out with us. Uh, next training day, sorry. Next training days are July 3rd, 16th, 17th, 23rd, and 24th. Um, if you're gonna come out with us, just make sure you have prior Hemlock Hero training. And our next Hemlock Hero training is in September. Yeah, perfect. Uh, next one, NSCC voucher. Yeah, so I'm excited to announce that a new training program funded through NSCC Ford in, uh, Forest Innovation Voucher. This program aims to build capacity for chemical control on private land, developed and taught by Jim Jochen and Donna Crossland. This program is more so tailored to forestry and conservation professionals, as well as large woodlot owners. So this course is a mix of classroom, field exercises, and it's about uh, forestry pesticide applicator is Jim's kind of uh, area, and that'll be one and a half days. And then Donna will be teaching the HWA chemical treatment training for two and a half days. So the program takes place August 12th to 15th. Thanks. <laughs> Next one. Oh, this is great. So at the end of the month, we're gonna have these amazing instructional videos. Uh, it's gonna be a series and it's developed by Nance Ankerman and Donna Crossland. It's identifying HWA and assessment of tree health, chemical treatment, preparation for treatment, basal bark spraying, and tree injection. Um, hopefully, we'll have them out by the end of July, but we have a little teaser for you. So get ready for this. into the canopy and holding the, the card up like this. Sorry, that's my mistake. Oh. <laughs> so you found HWA or hemlock oleodelgid in your woodlot. What do you do? Preparing the site for treatment to measure and mark your trees. Hey, 
measured and we're ready to go. All right. Not bad, right? I think they're going to be pretty darn good. <laughs> um, the last thing is we have a couple additional resources that have been included on our website. So you can look for the HWA Treatment Decision Key and the HWA Treatment Options Report. They're uploaded onto our website. And me and Matt will both be co-hosting an HWA webinar upcoming this summer. So we're hoping that these tools will help guide anyone into any HWA treatments that they want to do in the future. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. Our It feels like a small volunteer effort that just turned into this remarkable, committed um, conservation effort. So I'm really happy to be part of it. Thank you for everyone being here. Thanks, Jess. And Thanks to all our staff, so Matt and Mary Jane and everyone who's working beyond the scenes to make the content to share. I am going to move us into our business meeting if there's no objection to that, just in an effort to stick to my word of staying on schedule tonight. Thumbs up, Mary Jane. You're you're good for me to keep on keeping on. OK, I guess if, if folks do have questions, just feel free to uh, jot down our email or reach out to us via the website. And, and there is a good chance if you pop it in the chat, Mary Jane or someone else can field it in real time as we continue on. Not that you want to be distracted from this excitement. So our business meeting for the 2024 year. Our agenda is as follows. We're going to look for approval of the 2023 AGM minutes. Uh, except our new members who have joined over the past year, uh, have our election of new directors, uh, a financial report, and then adjournment. So, unless there are any uh, objections to approving the agenda as presented, we will consider that accepted. Abby, you're good to go on the minutes end. I am. You look like you're in the zone. Okay. Ready. So. Okay. Shall we, we review? Oh. oh yeah. Sorry. Were you gonna read them? Yeah. I uh, mean, do I have to? Yes. Approval okay. of the 2023 AGM minutes with highlights from Abby. With highlights. Excellent. I love it. Uh, okay, so the 2023 AGM was held in person at Maitland Bridge Hall in Maitland Bridge, Nova Scotia. We had 28 members in attendance, six uh, additional uh, members, directors from the board, uh, as well as four new directors were present at the time. The approval, the agenda was approved by Donna Crossland, uh, moved by Donna Crossland, seconded by Will, and approved. Uh, our AGM minutes from 2022. Uh, Karen Morley moved to accept as presented. Fritz uh, seconded that and we approved. The election of directors was our third item of business. A motion to accept Kiva Jarrar, Peter Neely, Melissa Labrador, and Mary Jane Roger as uh, new directors was moved by, by Will Martin and seconded by Cindy Stacer and approved. Uh, finally, our fourth item was to approve the new MCFC members from 2021 and 2022. Uh, and that motion was made by Don Kimball, uh, seconded by Donna Crossland, and of course approved. And finally, our fifth item of business was a financial report presented by Friedrich Meyer, 
uh, Will Martin moved to accept that financial statement from 2022 as presented. This was seconded by Daniel Gorkin and approved. And then we had a motion to adjourn. I don't have the time, but I bet we can beat it today. <laughs> Thank you. And would you be willing to move the acceptance of these minutes? Is there Absolutely. someone who would be willing to second? So I, I perhaps should have mentioned this easier earlier. If you're a member, you're welcome to vote on motions. Uh, you can do so by making sound or using the hands up icon. So we need a seconder. I see Mike Lancaster. Thank you very much. If there's no objection, we will consider this motion approved. Excellent. So moving on to the acceptance of new members. Um, so, oh, we have some of our new members on the call. That's very exciting. Be sure to kind of help us keep growing by sharing organizational information. Uh, with other contacts in your network. Uh, in 2023, we were joined by Scott Digweed, Sandra Sims Bishop, Daniel Danielle Robertson, Peter Neely, Melissa Labrador, Rachel Kendall, Norma Carey, Ann Gillis, Amy Mew, Garth Laidlaw, Douglas Carmody, and John Soule. And I'm hoping there's someone out there who would be willing to approve uh, the new members as read. I move to approve the new members as read. Thanks, Will. And someone to second? Heba. I can second that. Oh. Oh, he was icon one. Um, I did it. I seconded it. <laughs> <laughs> so if there is no objection, then we will consider the motion carried. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, election of our new directors. This is one we'll spend a little more time on. Uh, and we had done introductions, but a, I think at least one other board member slid in since the beginning of the meeting. So Melissa, if you're still here, uh, would you be able to give a brief introduction to the attendees as a board member? I think Melissa just rejoined. Um, oh, so I've been hearing can... people in and out. So, M Melissa, if you're here and you're you have a good internet, good enough internet connection, um, I would welcome you to make an introduction. If not, uh, Melissa is one of our board members who we didn't have the opportunity to meet earlier. I am here. Apologies, I've got five percent battery finally again. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, yes, um, just an introduction of who I am. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm Melissa Labrador. I live in the community of Wildcat, just uh, outside of Caledonia. Uh, I am the Indigenous lead for the Pemzik Mwadesigo on Godamugo, which is a conservation mosaic project kind of centered from Somerville Beach to uh, Hemian's Head or Black Point Beach and inland to the Toby Attic. Um, and I, I'm Still, I considered myself fairly new to MCFC, and uh, I do sit on a number of boards, Community Forest International and, and other similar boards around Nova Scotia. Uh, and I'm always happy to uh, connect with folks uh, in conservation, uh, in community forestry, and a number of different things. And yeah, so I'm happy I get to be here a few more minutes, and hopefully my phone stays uh, connected. Thank you. Uh, and Donna Crossland has also joined us and is uh, a longstanding member of the board. So Donna, if you're able to give the, the one minute introduction to yourself and the tremendous amount of work you do for the organization. And may not be in a, a place where it's easy to do that. So I'm going to keep going. We do have regrets from Steve. I think she's just on mute, Katie. Oh, I don't, so, I can't see her picture. So you I were was, on mute. I was on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I had said, um, I think I'm a recovering member from 
from uh, launching the HWA uh, conservation, the Hemlock Conservation uh, Project last year. And um, yeah, so it's been a long time. And I must say that I've been, yeah, I've been on the board since the very beginning. And uh, we've come a long way. And so it's, it's, uh, it's really great to see the MCFC now with so many irons in the fire and uh, no longer with the same struggles. And I think it's only getting stronger and the future's getting brighter and you're more, we're more and more a guiding light on so many issues in forestry. I don't know if that was really what you wanted me to say, but that's what came out of my mouth. It was perfect. <laughs> uh, and we did pretty good tonight. We have uh, regrets from one board member, Steve Ward. Uh, and in the past year, we've had one board member step down, and that was George Townsend. So I did want to give thanks and recognize the, the time that he did serve as a board member. Uh, and we have a pretty straightforward uh, lineup today. We are welcoming, hopefully, one new director, Alistair Jarvis. Uh, and so I am going to read a pretty formal bio on Alistair's behalf. Uh, but maybe, Alistair, do you want to give a quick hello as well, too? I can't hear you, but your mute icon is off. I'm not hearing anything or others. That's what I get for putting you on the spot. Hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I really loved um, listening in today. Um, I think my involvement with the community forest, although not so active in recent years, back to I think maybe before the community forest was was founded. Um, I remember sitting in with some of you on a bunch of community meetings and meetings with DNR. Um, it's just it's been wonderful to see from afar the work that you all been, have been doing, for which I'm super grateful. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to maybe be more active in contributing to the future success of the community for it. So thank you. Thank you. And so Alistair's been nominated to an economic seat. Um, for those unfamiliar with our board structure, we hold two seats for a declared environmental interest, two for a declared economic interest, two for members with a declared social interest, two for an Aboriginal interest, and four members at large. And then we also have an ex officio member representing natural resources who joins us as an observer. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead with Alistair's bio, which is up here. So Alistair brings over two decades of experience in technology, entrepreneurship and innovation with a steadfast commitment to creating substantial value and impact for communities, high performing teams and climate goals. As a former vice president of the entrepreneurship and technology strategy at the American Forest Foundation, Alistair spearheaded their agile transformation and crafted the technology strategy to educate, support, and empower private landowners in the stewardship of healthy forests. He co-founded and led Woods Camp, a data-driven platform designed to facilitate family forest owners in achieving their conservation goals. Acquired by the American Forest Foundation in 2018, Woods Camp has enabled thousands of North American landowners to explore sustainable forest management options. Alistair has a strong background in leading diverse and multicultural teams in forging connections with executive, government, and creative sectors. He has a woodlot owner, or sorry, he is, he has been a woodlot owner in Lunenburg County since 2006, is a past board member of NSWOA and co-created and encouraged both the Dexter and McNeil governments to adopt an innovation strategy in response to the closure of the Bowater Mill, was a founding member of the Medway Community Forest Co-op and participated as a core team member through Nova Scotia's Forest Lab in 2016. During his time at AFF, he served as a member of the U.S. Forest Service's FIA National User Group Steering Committee. His new startup, Statolith, is implementing remote sensing technologies to ensure 
the sustainable sourcing of forest materials required by emerging carbon removal markets. The company's mission to realize the potential of innovative technologies to remove CO2 from the atmosphere over the coming decades while simultaneously funding large-scale silviculture and forest restoration integrated forest stands. Alistair is dedicated to continuous learning and values cultural competence and inclusivity. Okay. So uh, I'm hoping there is someone out there who would be willing to nominate um, the, or sorry, he, he's already been nominated, but we'd like to accept Alistair as our newest member of the board of directors. I think I saw Fritz put his hand up. Is there someone to second that motion? I would be happy to second that motion. I saw Will before I saw your icon, Jane, sorry. Uh, and as long as there's no one who objects, we will consider the motion carried. Welcome to the board, Alistair. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Fritz for the real meaty portion of the business meeting, which is our financial update. With Four minutes left. No pressure. <laughs> I'm sorry. The the time overflows my problem. Stick around and listen to Fritz for his whole spiel. Oh, it's totally fine. Okay, so over the next two slides, we'll be looking at uh, the balance sheet as well as the profit and loss for the Medway Community Forest over the year 2023. So as you look at uh, the current slide up there, you see the 2023 as next to the 2022 data. And I think we're sticking here with the theme of a lot of things changed last year and we see that in our numbers. So if you take a look at the first line under assets, uh, so that's kind of like the sum, you see that reflected in the balance sheet of what we have, that's, that's cash. Um, at 93,407, 93, and that decreased significantly from the previous year, which was sitting at around 170,000. And this is because we had to buy quite a few things and some of those were trucks so in total we acquired two new trucks that went for the hwa program as well as one new that replaced a uh, um, very well used uh, truck we ran for our operations um, so accounts receivable we are sitting at twenty six thousand eight hundred fifty nine dollars so that's still money um owed to us so we, we invoiced but we didn't receive yet Majority of that is firewood sales at this point of the year. So it's pretty much right. We close the deadline there at December 31st. That's why you're seeing some, some of those numbers. HST recoverable. So we bought a lot of stuff that makes also for a lot of HST uh, recoverable from 2023 at $7,081 $7, compared to the year before. It was $5,922. Um, prepaid expenses of $4,327. This would be insurance, which is normally the common one and significantly higher to the previous year. Again, we paying our insurance for three vehicles. And then we have a due from Nova Scotia Working Woodlands Trust at 80,000. So this increased from last year, 77,000. And this is so the share of the director as well as expenses related to it, shares of rent as well as insurances. And then you'll see the number here. So that totaled at our assets at $211,869. But then we do have a significant increase here that totals our access um, by, uh, to 289966 And the increase there is property and equipment. And you see the number there, $78,097 compared to the year before on 2700. And this is the mostly the three trucks. And there's quite a few other uh, larger pieces of equipment in there, but the three the trucks there made them the bulk of it. So now to our liabilities, um, so accounts payable and accrued liabilities of 38,337, went down from the previous year of 55,000. Um, employee deductions payable, 8,844, um, a little bit up again. We have a lot more staff this year or last year with us than we had the year before. Wages payable, 2,922. This is mostly carry over from um, vacation. And income taxes payable, 5,686. As you see, we made some money this year, so we have uh, some income taxes to pay as well. 
no deferred revenue in 2023. So this went against our profit. And the past year, you see that carried at $104,000. And we have a current portion of long-term debt, which is the CBA loan at $30,000, which you in 2024 will no longer see on our books because that is uh, repaid. So that totaled our liabilities at $85,000. And then summing on top of that, our shareholder equities at $6,825. It made a surplus of $197.352, uh, which then totaled our liabilities to $204,177 and uh, balanced then our liabilities in total at $289,966 for 2023. And now we'll flip over to our profit and loss sheet. Uh, thanks, Katie. So for 2023, um, we had a little bit of, so you see again, 2023 against 2022, revenue on the top and expenses on the bottom. Um, our revenue starts with some income from consulting, which is pretty pretty small at $4,200. Uh, made some money as you as you saw from uh, Matt's presentation there. This is now from firewood, from cutting wood at 17,920. And our main bulk of our income sitting significantly higher than in 2022 is our $536,711 of grants, which split between our operational grants for the corporations in our Midway Community Forest, but a significant amount of HWA funding for the project we're currently running. Some merchandise income at $752, silver culture funding of $63,125, and um, Stumpage, we didn't, we obviously had um, a lot of silver culture done and we did some some cutting and this is mostly Freemans who through Stumpage sale paid us $36,497 and that sums our total revenue at $659,206 and then we had some direct costs related to that. You saw the silver culture um, trials we did at $39,018 as well as stumpage that we paid to the crown at 26,596. And it made a gross profit then of $593,592. Then on our expense side, we did spend significantly more compared to 2022 in advertising and promotion. Part of that is that um, little snippet of the short film you said, this is a multi-series, um, the episode uh, film that was produced and I think we're all excited to see it. Um, then amortization now was a newer, bigger line item. Again, that's reflecting our truck purchases of $13,457. Um, some business taxes, licenses, and membership and $3,632. So it's like our GIS licenses, um, Microsoft 365, those things. Uh, consultant expenses at 72,666. So this is healthy. Forest Consulting mostly to kickstart and run us through our, the HWA project and help with transitioning. We paid $6,464 in insurance. Again, this is a lot of vehicle contribution this time, hence the doubling since 2022. Um, interest and bank charges of $831. Office expenses, $1,502. Professional fees and bookkeeping, we're at 9,015, again, higher than 2022. This is simply due again to our ex expanding operations. There's more grants coming in and out and more um, administrative work to be done. Uh, rental expenses went up. So on top of the hub, we also now have a working base for the HWA. And you see that reflected in $9,370 of rent expenses. Repairs and maintenance, $7,700. And then salaries, wages, and benefits at $238,473. Pretty much double than it was in 2022. You just saw, you welcomed a lot of our new staff and you'll see that reflected in this number as well. Uh, so a lot of supplies, um, that HWA project has a lot of field supplies they need and they run through over the course of their treatment. And you saw the, those very impressive values. So we're sitting on $28,299 there. 2023. Um, telephone expenses, 1587 Training expense of $3,046. A lot of uh, travel expenses. It's quite a lot of big crew that travels across the province, 
eighteen dollars, as well as vehicle expenses. So you're looking at three vehicles, uh, regular service, registration, tires. So it's eleven thousand nine hundred and thirty-nine dollars, which sums um, our expenses to four hundred thirty-eight thousand four hundred and fifty. And on top of that, there's some miscellaneous revenue, uh, list on loss on disposal of property. So that's our old old truck that we sold for. Not much money there, had a broken frame. And um, so I'm gonna total this up here. Net income for the year was sitting at 146,070 cents. So compared to last year, we made quite a bit more money, but also a bit more taxes to pay on that. Sorry, five minutes more than I thought. <laughs> um, any questions on this one or the previous one? I think there's something in the chat, Sarah, or is that from? Oh. Oh good, just the welcome. There are no questions. I'd like to make the move to accept the financial report for 2023 as presented. Thank you, Fritz. So Fritz is moved. Is there a seconder? Mike Lancaster and any discussion? Okay, so hearing no objection, we will consider the financial reports approved. Thank you. Okay, we've almost done it. The last thing be after I say thank you so much for joining us six whole minutes after a motion to adjourn. Oh, my screen's changing as people drop off. So I see Fritz as, as the individual who wins the prize for adjournment this evening. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you can go out, enjoy the sunset. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.